haven't seen an LSP expand into full-on business software that's non-related to translation. Being able to control machine translation with knobs and turning them and the whole politeness filter or skew. I mean, that to me is sort of like providing a translator almost with a creative brief. The idea really was to get breakthroughs that were happening in research to people, to users and professional translators in particular as quickly as possible. And welcome everyone to SlaterPod 73. Welcome from Zurich. Hello from London. 73, going in on the three quarter of a century soon. <laughs> getting there, yeah. Yeah, getting there. Let's do something special on our 100th episode, which will be sometime... I don't know what it will be, October, maybe? Four months. November. Um, yeah, to guest today, Samuel Loibli, partner and CTO of MT as a managed service provider, Text Shuttle. I just made that up, MT as a managed service provider. I think that's what they are, but let, let Samuel um, tell us how he sees the company, yeah. which I've been aware of not ever since it started, but very early on. I think we... Had him at an early Slater con here in Zurich uh, mm -hmm. three or four years ago, and uh, and they've been they've been doing really well. They've stayed under the radar. They haven't raised anything. Uh, we're going to ask him about that. As far as I know, they haven't raised anything, any any funding. But uh, you know, they're they're hiring, and uh, business seems to be going well. So a lot of machine translation discussion today. Uh, we're going to talk about state of the art in MT, and generally, it's going to be quite a techie episode today. On the agenda, first, remote simultaneous interpreting fundraise. Uh, you're going to tell us more about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Briefly, uh, going down to Australia, again, Straker, always great, 100 pages, annual report, lots of information about the industry in there, not just about Straker as a, as a company. Then interesting uh, technology buy over in the, the U.S., talk a bit about Japan's largest LSP, Honyaku, that also filed. And then two short MT stories, both big and small, to transition over to Samuel. So let's kick this off, though, with Lithuania mm. and a company called Interactio. Yes. What's going on? Yeah, well, they've just raised uh, quite a substantial amount of money in a Series A round. They raised 30 million US dollars for the remote in interpreting startup. Uh, mm -hmm. Interactio might be familiar to some of our audience because we did cover them fairly recently when they had a deal win um, yes. with the European Parliament. Um, so yeah, we, we covered them quite recently. That was a big win for them. Um, but this Series A round was announced end of well, a couple of days ago, end of May. Um, and they had a small amount of Funding previously, I think around two million US dollars um, that was from a number of different funds and angel investors. But in this uh, 30 million round, lots of uh, lots of investors, lots of new investors and um, the existing investors as well. So you had the round being led by venture capital funds, Eight Roads Ventures and Storm Ventures. So Eight Roads uh, was one of the, I think, an early investor in Alibaba. And Storm is uh, has PipeDrive as a portfolio company. PipeDrive. We, we know quite well. <laughs> I like PipeDrive. A, because yeah. we had him as a speaker, and B, because I'm basically spending a lot of my time right now in PipeDrive because we just transitioned to PipeDrive. Um, yes, I thought can warmly that. recommend <laughs> that it's a CRM out. system. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then they had existing investors as well. I think four or five of them, Change Ventures, Practica Capital, 70 Ventures, and Lemonade Stand Ventures. Great names, plus some angel investors as well. Eight Roads, Lemonade. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But we, spoke, I mean, we spoke to them, obviously, a little bit about the business. They couldn't share a particular valuation, but they said they are profitable and that they had 12 times run rate growth in 2020. So pretty, yeah, a lot of... A lot of number, lot, a lot of interpreting, a lot of remote simultaneous. A lot of remote interpreting, there. talking yeah. about timing and all of that, right? So they started in 2014 as an RSI mm -hmm. platform in Lithuania, and probably had to tell a lot of people, ex like, explain them what is what it is they're trying to do, and then something mm -hmm. like COVID comes along and it just, uh, you know, changes the entire equation, and you know, lo and behold, 
you have 30 million in, 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 in Series A, which, you know, for a startup that was launched in 2014, like a, a Series A seven years later is somewhat, yeah. like it's unusual, right? So it kind of shows you the, the effect of, of COVID on that. So they would be a direct competitor of Interpreify, not yeah. really Kudo, because Kudo is more multilingual meetings, not so mm. much focusing on the the like the conferencing aspect. But mm. I mean, Interactio is very much conferencing, big events, big conferencing, these types of uh, uh, use cases, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that their core segment is is the the likes of European Commission, European Parliament, United Nations. So that's definitely what it's geared geared up for i think in a future step they're they're likely to expand the client base somewhat to corporate corporate clients is what they said um that i think they described it as a larger public that has the need for professional multilingual communication so in that sense maybe they would be going into kudo territory um but they yeah, are I wonder, at the moment mm, go ahead. yeah sorry i wonder how much of this is like just basically painting as broad a vision as mm. possible to you know raise money and just make the, yeah basically just paint paint the broad very broad vision and, and to expand yeah. the potentially addressable market uh mm-hmm. and how much is like in reality that's what they're serving but yeah you can do a lot with those 30 million well yeah and i think they're going to be hiring as you might expect with a focus on france brussels also as you might expect for that customer base um and putting some people in the us so looking for some really senior roles, head of design, VP of engineering, um, and a number of remote interpreting training managers, customer success managers, all of that. Um, yes. So lots to, Interesting lots that to they'd come, go. Sure. Yeah, lots to come. And uh, I didn't really have them on my active radar. Um, mm. I mean, I've, I've known them and we've, you know, we've covered them in, in the European Union context, but mm. that type of funding, you know, also speaks to potentially a broader uh, private sector client portfolio. Mm. Um, Talking about private sector, I think that's most of Straker's business. So they published a a 100-page annual report, which you delved into. So give us the top five bullets here. Top five. Okay. Yeah, Straker translations listed in Australia. We spoke about them a couple of weeks ago because they announced their fourth quarter results. So these annual results, full year results for their 2021 uh, were in line with what they'd already confirmed. So they generated around 22.6 million US dollars uh, in the 12 months to the end of March this year. And that's 13% revenue growth. So good, good growth. Um, EBITDA level, though, everything's kind of hovering around break even still. Um, but they, yeah, I mean, they, they delved into a few, well, a lot of stuff, as you can imagine, 100 pages, but um, they were talking about the geographical split as well and how the regions performed in during uh, during the year. They had 90% growth in Asia, uh, which is actually their, is their smallest segment, but, I mean, huge, huge growth there um, on a percentage base. From a base. small base. So From a small base. Um, looks like they have closed a few clients, yeah. Yeah, they had growth in the US, so that was mainly due due to Lingotech, which the TMS provider LSP that they acquired a couple of months ago, and that started to contribute from from February, and declines in in Europe, but Europe still uh, continues to be their biggest market with I think around forty five percent contribution to overall revenues, but I think. Yeah, on the shares, they're doing extremely well. On the day of the announcement, there was, I think, about 14% jump in shares price uh, on the day of the release. And their market cap is now around 88.5 million US dollars, an all-time high. They're doing great on the whole um, the story side of things. And, and there's activity now with Lingotech, so they're, they're mm. executing on, on, on that strategy. It's... It's just it's it's interesting that they'd be valued at nearly a hundred million dollars. Um, They've got some good for, logos. Um, I mean, the we covered the IBM deal a while ago, and that's that's begun begun to ramp up now. Um, so yeah, lots. yeah, it needs to transfer into profitability at some point. Um, yeah, because EBITDA yeah. ramp break even wouldn't justify a hundred million dollar valuation. So, well, good luck with that. 
And um, another interesting company that we have, haven't really covered that often, but that have mm. popped up in all of these kind of fast growing LSP lists is a Corby. Mm -hmm. And a Corby is uh, one of the largest, or it, it's, they're, they're calling themselves the largest privately owned female owned LSP in the US, like one of the mm -hmm. largest female owned, I guess now, or the largest after Liz Elting yeah. uh, left, you know, was, uh, well, no longer owns TransPerfect. So about 50 million, I think, plus in, in revenue. And why are we talking about them today? They acquired uh, something called Run My Process, runmyprocess.com uh, from mm. Fujitsu. And it, no relation, as far as I can see, to language services. It's a... So Run My Process is a kind of a low-code um, process automation platform. Sounds um, <laughs> sounds <laughs> a little dull, but what does it do? Like it's basically, you know, they, they gave one client study, like um, I think some Scandinavian large enterprise. They moved from mm -hmm. like a, a Lotus uh, or like an IBM Notes environment okay. over to a, a Google Workspace and then certain like admin processes, like approvals of expenses, et cetera, um, needed to be uh, further automated. And that's when what they used Rama Process for. So low, low code meaning you don't really have to, it's kind of like this drag and drop environment, like that, mm. uh, you know, probably in, in like Notion or like, no, do, do you know Notion? Um, no. so, like it's, yeah, it's quite, quite drag and drop or, mm -hmm. or like some website software, like, like softer, et cetera. Long story short, uh, don't really know what their plans are with, with this unit in terms of how it complements the language services side. Probably mm -hmm. the only, my only take here would be that they're apparently very techy and probably can automate a ton of like the backend, the kind of the ERP translation management side of of the language services component, if they're if they're using this at all, if mm. not, it's just going to be part of that new unit they call a Corby a Digital. Corby Digital, yeah. So, haven't seen this before. Haven't seen an LSP expand into full on business software that's non related mm. to translation. So, looks like they feel comfortable and have the funds to finance something like this. So, interesting. Yeah. Not much else I can say about this. Um, so heading over to Japan, and yeah, we're kind of r rattling off uh, a lot of the, this week's <laughs> stories. So uh, not much commentary on this. But uh, Japan, Honyaku Center, again, largest LSP in Japan, uh, posted results, revenue decline, 14% 14, 14, um, percent revenue decline. So no super mm. cycle or boom for Honyaku Center. But that said, Japan is getting hit again with COVID. Uh, yeah. they, they have like the fourth wave. They're really lagging behind in terms of vaccinations. And uh, I've also read that the Olympics are, they're considering postponing the Olympics. I think mm -hmm. uh, some of the bigger CEOs are actually in favor of canceling them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Japan uh, looking, looks, looks like a tough place to do business this year, uh, yet again. And so Honyaku Center's revenues dropped 14% down to 91 million. They managed to retain some operating income, like 3.8 million, which again, like shows that you can scale up and down relatively quickly in LSPs mm -hmm. and remain profitable. I mean, other businesses that have higher fixed costs, if they take a 14% top line hit, they probably, um, uh, the corresponding hit on the earnings would be, would be larger, but in translation, you can scale up or down somewhat easily. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, other than that, they just, they, you know, try to automate, use MT, they push over the phone interpreting and some web, web conferencing in their in their interpreting and, and convention unit. So let's see. Um, yeah, fond memories of uh, visiting Tokyo, you know, talking to Honyaku, but uh, looks like uh, another tough year for them. So mm. Pharma, you said Pharma did quite well though, right? The yeah, you're right. Pharma, pharma that well has been doing well for for quite some time. Uh, that was in the translation unit, which just mm -hmm. looking at translation, it was about seventy million dollars, and uh, but mm -hmm. it also declined seven percent. So the pharma space did well. So from a vertical perspective, it's what you'd expect, right? Yeah. Um, just quick one we came across in our sweep service, uh, IntelliCat, um, mm -hmm. a research paper by Bearing Lab. Remember Bearing Lab in April? I know the name, the MT, MT? Correct. 
<laughs> so, empty stuff. Yeah, we're we're fully prepared for the podcast today. <laughs> Completely prepared. We're ready to go. Uh, no, so <laughs> so Bearing Lab as we covered it back in April. Uh, you know, six seven weeks ago, legal mm-hmm. and IP translation. MT startup. Oh, they got yeah. funded by Naver. Naver is the Korean search engine, kind of the Korean Google. And um, yeah, so back then they told us the Bearing Lab, uh, you know, this is Naver gets, they said Naver gets pitched by thousands of companies each year and they're only investing about 20. So they apparently saw something in, in, in Bearing Lab. And what does Bearing Lab do? Well, why do we come across it? Well, they published a research paper about a tool called IntelliCat, which is a Post editing and interactive translation environment, mm. which is actually available online, so you can go out and check it out. It's um, I don't know. Hang on, what's the? Like Intelli- it's free to use or IntelliCat. Yeah, it's we free can to just... use. Oh, okay. IntelliCat. Oh, there in in IntelliCat dot bearinglab dot com, mm-hmm. and thankfully for me, the only demo version available is English to German. So, uh, unlu- unluckily for them, though, unfortunately for them, though, um, I was able to, of course, then check the quality, and I got to say, uh, it still lacks DeepL a lot by by quite a lot, and Google mm-hmm. as well. So there's still some not very um, some super clunky MT uh, output there. Anyway, so long story short, it's a it's um, you you can go around. Uh, you can go to that uh, website. You can play around with with the tool. It's a demo version. You can upload again. It's English into German. It has like an empty quality score on the side. Uh, and then if you want to delve deeper into the functionality, you can actually read the research paper. So I've really do, do you think yeah. that the quality score tallies up to the quality? You said that maybe the quality wasn't so hot the whole time. Do you think it roughly has estimated or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would actually agree with the score. So the yeah. one, the simple ones are higher. Uh, so like seventy five percent, and then, yeah, like it goes down to. Yeah, you're, yeah, it's 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 indicative, but mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure how useful it, that is. But you know, it's another player with a publicly visible product that you know, s- since they got funding, we're probably going to hear more about them uh, in the future yeah. as well. And uh, one small company, you know, you also want to have on, on your radar when you look at machine translation is Microsoft. Oh, yeah, uh, I've heard of them too. Yeah, who's, uh, you know, whose founder is leading an extravagant lifestyle. No, I'm, I shouldn't comment on that, but uh, he's gotten he's gotten bad press recently, Bill Gates. Uh, so, uh, but a few, few, a few rungs down the corporate ladder, although I don't actually know, he's, I think it's just a shareholder, he's no longer involved on, on any level with the company. But why am I talking about Microsoft? Well, they, they keep pushing out these, the, uh, Microsoft and Amazon actually, they keep pushing out like almost weekly announcements at this point mm-hmm. about new additions to their enterprise level MT offerings. And it's super customized at this point. So it's also something actually I want to talk to Samuel about like how they yeah. see this as their competition. Yeah. Because Microsoft now launched a uh, full, well, they called the post translate full documents with document translation now in general availability so that's on Mm -hmm. the Azure cloud platform and you can do all kinds of stuff like you can translate you know a ton of file formats and you know automatically to deck languages translate documents that have content in multiple languages Mm -hmm. um into multiple languages batch translation etc right so the key takeaway here is we've spoken about it in the past, but big tech and all these customizations they're adding is a significant competitor to the entire kind of niche language tech language services ecosystem, in my view. It's good. But we yeah. shall consult. We, yeah, I think it would be good to get Samuel's take on that also. Yeah, we shall consult consult with... Samuel, who started a company that is directly competing with them and uh, seems to be doing so extremely successfully. So catch you on the flip side. All right. See ya. And welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to SlaterPod. Today with Samuel Loibli, uh, founder and CTO of TechShuttle. Hi, Samuel. Hello, everyone. 
Hi, welcome. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to speak to us today, Sam. It's great to have you. Uh, where does this podcast find you? Are you in Zurich at the moment? I am. Yes, I'm at home, actually, as you might be able to see in Zurich. Get it, get it. Yeah, not not much, not much traveling for anyone. Although you know things are getting better here, except the weather. Not don't want to talk about the weather, but I just <laughs> read now that this was the worst spring in 34 years, the coldest one in Zurich. So, yeah, yeah I know we shouldn't talk about weather, but I just read it five minutes ago. So, <laughs> anyway, so uh, hey Samuel, uh, again, thanks for joining. Uh, we I introduced you as um, again, of course, from Tech Shuttle, and MT as a managed service. But first, tell us a bit more about your personal background. How did you get into this whole machine translation space? On the one hand, as a researcher, and then also as an entrepreneur, just to get a bit of the backstory here. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, I got into this when I well started to study, uh, well, it's, it's some time ago, actually, 10 years or so, at the University of Zurich. Um, I got attracted to this field of computational linguistics, and honestly, I didn't know much about it. I was interested in, in programming, but not so much in, you know, the classic IT kind of thing, like you sit in your, uh, your cellar and you, you like hack things and it's all about math. Um, well, Turns out now it's all about math, obviously, but that's another story <laughs> I didn't know at the time. So I started uh, studying computational linguistics. And at the time, um, we had a very good professor, uh, Martin Folk, is still there, actually, um, who, who got me interested in this whole thing. Um, and I went on to do a master's in Edinburgh and so on, really wanted to focus on that. And then I um, had my first job in the industry at uh, Autodesk, a software company um, in the US. And um, well, there my job really was to um, make machine translation better or to use machine translation to make translators faster in localizing software products. And so that that's really how I kind of got into it. Um, I felt, however, I mean, working at a big company can be interesting. Yes, and it has its benefits, that's for sure. Um, but well, there was a paradigm shift on the horizon, neural machine translation. I mean, Slater has certainly covered it in the past and, and even today. Um, so I felt like it's maybe a good idea to go back into academia to, well, just, you know, learn more about it. Because at the time, um, well, people who were had a background in statistical machine translation really didn't know much about it. And I don't regret this at all. I think when I went mm. back to academia in 2016, this was really very much the right decision. Um, and that's also how Tech Shuttle started, um, because at the time you couldn't really get this. There wasn't a commercial offering for neural machine translation. I mean, yes, at some point Google shifted, of course, and then DeepL came along, but that was all a bit later. And, and it was, it was kind of clear to us that, well, this is going to have an impact, um, on the industry as well. And yeah, might be a good idea to, um, start a company there. So hang on, you started the company at the same time you started your PhD? Pretty much, pretty much, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got back to Zurich and then a few months later, we, we decided we would, would actually do this, yeah, yeah. So you thought one wasn't going to keep you busy enough, huh? <laughs> exactly. It's not, it's not that I never regretted this decision, but overall, <laughs> it's actually worked out rather well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, well, then just tell me a bit of the, I, I don't know, anecdote around the founding and then how kind of how it started, how it's going around Tech Shuttle and also the business model in a nutshell before we, you know, go into MT kind of more generally. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. Well, actually, I mentioned that we founded the company, but technically this isn't really true. Uh, Tech Shuttle existed. It was actually founded um, by two professors at the University of Zurich in 2009 already. Um, and the, well, at the time, statistical machine translation was the big thing. And the idea was to um, produce um, systems that are geared to um, the media industry. So basically subtitling, mm. because they had short sentences and everything. And you could actually show in research that, well, you have an advantage if you post that at this um, output for subtitles, even at the time. Um, but well, it turned out it wasn't so easy, actually. Machine translation wasn't easy to pitch to people. There was a lot of resistance, not, not only um, from professional translators who actually produced these subtitles at the time, but it also wasn't the thing, really. Machine translation wasn't in the news as such. So, uh, yeah. And then um, so we kind of reactivated it um, a bit later because, again, this paradigm shift was coming. And um, so so that's that's how that went down, basically. 
it's not much of an anecdote. It's maybe more a bit of a history. Um, <laughs> a history. Um, so, yeah. but you, let's let's continue from 2016. So sure. you you reactivated the company. Uh, what was the vision at the time, and how has it changed uh, until now? Uh, yeah. Just the kind of the the company elevator pitch, basically. Okay, okay. I'm always very bad at that, and I still am. So, <laughs> but the idea, <laughs> the idea it. really was <laughs> to get you know breakthroughs that were happening in research to 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 people to users and professional translators in particular as as quickly as possible because well the bigger a company is well the more of a de delay you usually have i mean you build your machine translation pipeline that's cost a lot of money and you got to monetize it so for quite some time actually many companies were saying yeah you know neural machine translation it's a thing and all but well, in many cases statistical machine translation may really work better and so on so we we, we didn't want to do this right we didn't have this legacy or technical that whatsoever um so that was really the goal you know there's something new it's good you can benefit from it you should do so as soon as possible got it i mean and if you're fast forwarding five years now just maybe a bit of uh, your thoughts on how good machine translation is the basic question but i think it's one that's uh, the good to good to answer um so how good is mt in your view and what tell us about the current state of machine translation Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question, obviously, and, and one that you can talk about for hours and days, right? You can write books, yeah. books about it, what's quality and so on. Um, but, but clearly, I think machine translation today is, um, uh, well, at a level where it's certainly useful. It's useful to both professional translators and, and also everyone on the internet, really, right? So for professionals, it's really been proven in many, many language combinations and domains. You can save time if you use machine translation. This is not about replacing them, but it's it's a productivity tool, right? So that's, that's rather evident, I'd say. And well, for everyone out there, obviously it's it's a tool to, to get a gist of what's in a text. I think this works fairly well. If you have a contract in a language you don't understand, well, probably not accurate in every detail, no, but you can get the idea of what the text is about. Um, mm. It has weaknesses though. Um, and I think these are actually important to talk about too, right? And, and where I see weaknesses is really, it's, it's about, when we talk about quality, it's about context. Machine translation is very often still sentence based. So what's in a document isn't really considered when a sentence is translated. So basically when you translate a text, you get, well, a sequence of translated sentences. You don't really get a translated text back from a system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also there's little control. I think this is, this is also very annoying with machine translation today. You know, we've, we've seen little features such as this politeness feature that DeepL offers, for example, now, right? So politeness do see in German, for, for example. Um, but, but other than that, there's really not so much you can control about machine translation, right? So it, it gives you something. It's usually not too bad, but if you want to, if you want to set, uh, well, a few knobs and see, like, I want, I want, the output to be more like this or more like that, it's not so easy. And let me just jump in briefly. So you mentioned the document level and, you know, sometimes I get lost when we try to cover these topics on Slater because it's so, it's on one that's super complex. It's very academic, but with this document level context, is the general problem just compute? It's just, it's too much. It's overwhelming. <sighs> or is it that the knobs are not quite right? And so what is the core problem to getting this? better not right but better mm -hmm. yeah that's that's uh that's difficult i mean you you can frame it or, or cast it as a hardware problem yes so basically the problem is you have a sentence and then technically you have a maximum length of a sentence you produce in the target language and the basic problem is at every position so at every word there can be any word in the, in the vocabulary of the target language, right? So if you combine this, so every word times every word and so on throughout a whole sentence, this gives you a huge amount of combinations of possible combinations. Mm. So it's already a very expensive problem. When you compute the translation of a sentence, this, you know, it's a lot of, lot of calculations involved. So obviously, if you want to go beyond that level, yes, technically it could, could be similar to, to just, you know, computing a sentence, but then you need even more hardware. And so, so yes, if, if you, if you leak, leave the mechanisms, if you use the same ones we have today, that's actually been done in research. It's been done successfully. Um, it's just too slow and it's too expensive these days yet, yeah. mm. but, but this is going to change, I guess. And, and you mentioned the part of the, the vision of tech shuttle was to get, 
uh, MT into the hands of professional translators. I think that also ties in a bit with uh, with your doctoral thesis that that you published recently. Um, can you give us just a quick uh, overview, brief intro into into your thesis and some of the contexts around it? Um, sure, I, I can try it. I, I don't want to bore every, anyone here, so it's uh, yeah, it's, it's also <laughs> online, of course. Um, no, but but the thesis basically tackles. Um, three key challenges in, in machine translation for, for professionals, um, because overall the background is that I think machine translation in the context of professional translation, well, there hasn't been so much research about this. Of course, there's all these technical papers out on the archive, but the typical machine translation researcher doesn't necessarily care about professionals. I'm not, not even sure if the big companies really do, but maybe we can come back to that later. Um, but so the, the three challenges I was tackling uh, were, were quality, uh, there was this study or experiment about human parity, right, where Microsoft claimed, oh, we're as good as translators, uh, professional translators in translating news now, which turned out not to be the case, depending on the evaluation setup. It was about presentation. Um, um, we found that the way in which you show translations, not necessarily machine translation, can be fuzzy matches to professionals, um, actually has an impact on how fast they work and, and how accurately they can work, possibly. Mm. And then there was another part about adaptability that was a bit more technical um, where, well, the gist is machine translation can actually incorporate resources that professionals have been using for a long time, talking translation memories, terminology databases. Um, but this is not necessarily available to them because of the tooling they use. Yeah. So these are the three main points, I'd say. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned that, I mean, well, in terms of research, your, the title of your thesis was Machine Translation for Professional Translators. That's as accessible to the industry as, as it can be. <laughs> you know, usually you read these papers and it's like, it's a super obscure title, although they sometimes try yeah. to get, give it a better title. But this one, as far as the industry cares, this one is as good as the title is as it's possible. It's pretty eye catching, right? I think. It's pretty eye catching. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, you know, empty for professional translators. Yeah. There yeah. You go. Um, <laughs> You mentioned the top to bottom versus left to right aspect. And I mean, I'm a former translator. So for me, it was always, are you looking, you mean the sentence? Like here is the, the source. And then on the other side is the sentence. Like, do yeah. we know what's the more common variety? And can you just delve a little bit more into that? Because I find it fascinating. I just couldn't possibly picture myself having the source on the left and then translating on the right. To me, it was always top to bottom. So I'd be interested to know what the differences are there. Ah, so for you, it was always top me. Yeah, let's, let's come back to this. Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe I can okay. explain a bit. Um, so, so yes, exactly. It's about how sentences are shown on a screen, right? And, and mm -hmm. there's a few weird things happening if you work with a cat tool, if you will. I mean, people have now accepted it. I mean, it was a huge discussion back in the late nineties, early two uh, thousands, right? So, oh, you have this cat tool. You basically, throw out all the, the layout the text has, and you, you basically format it as an Excel spreadsheet, right? And then there's um, the source sentence on the left and the target sentence, well, that, that field can then be empty where you write in your translation or now you get a suggestion from your translation memory or from your machine translation system. Um, yes, so this is the classical arrangement, I would say, at least that that's what the study participants told us. So most translators we have um, uh, recruited for this uh, study, they were used to having the source sentence to the left and then the translation to the right. But there's another configuration where your source sentence is on the top and then underneath it, you can actually write out a translation. And if you think about this, like just, to, you know, the amount of eye movements or the distance you make with your yeah. eyes, if you constantly go from, from left to right, nah, 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 this is actually more than if it's just top and bottom and there's, yeah, there's probably less uh, eye movement, movement involved there. And we're not sure, we haven't used eye, eye tracking or something, but I mean, one of the findings was that, well, even if participants didn't use this setup, when they used it in the study, they actually find it rather convenient and it made them faster. So one explanation could be that it's just closer together. Um, well, in most languages, at least. I mean, the study was in uh, English to German translation. Yeah. Yeah, that was my my uh, direction. So, yeah, I mean, I concur. I couldn't possibly think about left, right. That would just... Um, you get a bit but... dizzy after a while. 
<laughs> yeah, and just uh, I mean, it's 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 closer, right? It's closer. Mm. Which uh, I mean, maybe it was the, the specific Trotter setup, but look, that's ancient history. That was like twenty, uh, so like two thousand five. Um, all right, let's go super philosophical, and I want to get your take. So when people ask me, literally from investors to LSPs to uh, you know whatever friends, I keep saying that MT truly creative MT is kind of impossible unless we achieve artificial general intelligence at some point what what's your take there like truly creative wouldn't the jumps and the creativity be only possible if we get artificial general intelligence and then i keep saying to people i would say like well and then we have different pr problems other than translation so once you achieve that <laughs> level of machine learning then translation is the least of our problem I, just you as the expert what are your, what are your thoughts on the technical feasibility of that you mean like the, the general artificial intelligence would then fool you and trick you and be like, oh, so it's a, no, no. Other it's just, I guess then we have Skynet, right? Then like what's, <laughs> okay. what's then translation is one of the things, but then I guess planes yeah. fly and cars are self-driving and there's all these other things that are going on. I see. I see. Ah, I, I find predictions so hard to make and so horrible. In, in machine translation, they were always so wrong, right? I mean, you, yeah, I don't want to go back to the 60s now, but it's like, yeah, it's been yeah. a five-year problem for so long, really, and then it's solved. A truly creative. I mean, what is what is truly creative translation? Um, if you think about how a machine translation system is trained or how it learns, I mean, what does it do? It, it looks at existing translations and then tries to imitate these translations when you bring in a new text, right? Um, and now you can go two ways when you argue about this. So you can say, well, no, because it imitates, it, it can never be truly creative in that sense because it's always going to imitate what it sees in text. On the other hand, if you think about how, how a human translator learns, well, it's probably also with, you know, looking at translations and then just, well, kind of reproducing this to some extent, right? And, and honestly, I couldn't say, I couldn't say uh, if, if maybe at some point there's, there's so much text and so many things to combine and, and you, you, you add some, some more technology to the mix. I mean, Maybe it's not truly creative in the sense that these machines will then think and will also be able to play chess and everything, um, but it, it could at least seem as if it was creative. I, I think this would mm. be possible. Um, yeah, but, but I think that the problem here is how you define truly creative machine translation. Um, well, to uh, me, it would be truly creative would be like that it takes like these kind of somewhat editorial judgments, right? That it would say, well, this, this is very differently worded, but it still means the same at, at at the core, right? Okay. Or maybe even say, well, that kind of, that is almost untranslatable. That's a very Chinese concept. Let me try to adapt this to a US context, for example, right? And you could yeah. defend it as, as a human translator, you could always go and defend it, but could a machine ever like start taking these types of decisions? Yeah, I think it could, because when you, I mean, we often talk about these cultural differences in, in translations or, well, uh, languages, right? But when you, if the training material you use actually contains examples of when people have made this transfer, I mean, why couldn't the machine reproduce it, right? If a human translator, so, oh, this is a very Chinese concept, produces a translation that's then, well, an English um, equivalent, well, not an equivalent, but it comes close to it, right? I mean, well, that's then in the training material. And so for this exact exact entity, maybe the machine would, would even be able to, to reproduce it. So, yeah, hard to say. But, but it's going to be imitation. It's not going to be thinking and being like, oh, yeah, but uh, considering like the, you know, the page this is on and like, yeah, with this background image and everything, oh, that's what they want to suggest. So, well, if, if, if we want to take that into consideration, I guess, then Florian, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. You'd have to at least take more information into account than just the text, basically, when you, when you produce a creative translation. Mm. Cool. It, that closes some... the philosophical part. <laughs> I, I was yes. going to ask, actually, if there's something there. Earlier, you were talking about being able to control machine translation with knobs and turning them and uh, the, the whole politeness filter or skew. I mean, that to me is sort of like providing a translator almost with a creative brief where you're saying See, uh, yeah. the, tone, the tone should be X. And then exactly. the machine would be able to replicate that. So it, it's creative in a sense, but it's responding to those inputs and those knobs. Maybe yeah, that's exactly. some kind of interim towards creativity. I, I think so. I think so. I mean, if you, if you think about politeness, that's, that's one feature. It's, yeah, how, 
you would breathe a human maybe, right? And, and there can be other things. I mean, if you want, even if you want a text to be shorter or longer, these things are relatively easy to adjust even today, not necessarily available. Well, in cat tools or your online system, but, but you can do it technically, right? I think about, I don't know, gender neutral language or something like this. It's really, if this is, yeah, okay, I want it to, to be gender neutral or no, I don't want this, whatever. Like today, it just scrambles together things. And then in one sentence is like that and it's like that. So I, I guess that's maybe one way to coming closer to this. Not sure if it's creative, but, but at least it's, it's more controlled in the sense that it would maybe produce a text that comes closer to what a briefed human being would, would produce. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, let's come back to text shuttle and talk a bit more about the, the business model. Um, so, I mean, Florian, like I said, in the intro, intro so MT is a managed service. What, what are your thoughts about MT as a managed service in terms of being a growth area of, of the language industry? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I should say I am, I'm certainly not um, uh, the, the most knowledgeable person uh, when it comes to like, you know, uh, business um, prospects and everything. I mean, I'm, I'm a CTO at Tech Shuttle, um, but um, I think machine translation as a managed service uh, clearly has um, its benefits. So there's, there's definitely a need for it in, in the language services industry. Um, if you just think about how you know, how many resources there are out there. Um, and I mean, talking again, translation memories, term bases and so on that people have been curating for, for years, decades sometimes, and they are not necessarily used even when people use machine translation these days, right? So of course you can connect your, your whatever system and then tie it into your cat tool in some way, but, but. But these resources that have, that are there, they're not considered. Um, and, and so basically, of course, if you, if you have your own technical expertise, maybe you can, you can mix them together. Um, but as soon as this is not the case, um, well, then you probably need some kind of a managed service. If you don't want to take over these technical aspects that come, that necessarily come with machine translation. Yeah. And is that the driver do you think in terms of the clients that tech shuttles working with is and, and the types of problems that you're looking to solve for clients is it they don't want to do the technical side or is there what else is there that drives this clients to come to uh, a company like tech shuttle mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean i'd say so that's certainly one driver and and i mean it really it doesn't make sense for every small language services department to to hire their own technical specialists to do machine translation but they, you also you don't so don't have a person that creates a cat tool for you typically right maybe some people do the very big ones do yes but but typically you you, you don't um so so yes that's that's among the, the key problems we solve and maybe more um if we go more into the details it's it's also um, about, of course, it's about then making translation specialists faster, right? So yeah, okay, you have these resources and then if you produce a domain adapted system, okay, the output is going to be closer to what you eventually want to, you has, have less post editing effort. Um, but I think that's not, that's not all about it. I mean, we, we basically, um, we don't work with tons of companies yet, right? If you, if you look at our website, there's, there's a few companies, yes, uh, bigger players in Switzerland, mostly that may have their own language services department. Um, but they've been regarded as, well, that's my understanding, at least as a cost center, right? So in many big corporations, they have translation specialists and it's always like, you know, at the last minute, oh no. Okay. So now we got to translate this fantastic. And what it costs me X thousand dollars. This is, this is horrible. Right. Um, but now the, these, these people, and not only the translation departments, they have translation needs, right? So, so if they want to translate a contract quickly or something, they have a legal department. Well, it would be very handy if they could actually use the resources that have been produced inside the company, because there's a way in which certain words are translated. And if you go to your online service of choice, well, yes, maybe you have to, to anonymize the document. Okay. Um, and, and then you have mistranslated words that are in there. And so I think if then, well, for our clients, for example, if they can make their machine translation system available to the entire company for them to translate, it's a way to also make visible, Hey, we're actually providing value here. We're not just a cost center. And, and that's, that's mm -hmm. one of the, the main drivers for, for, um, our business or our clients as well. Let's say if that makes sense. <laughs> 
Yeah. How do you guys do like sales and marketing? I mean, I, I take it you're not on the front line of sales, right? As, <laughs> you can see CTO, it, right? But, <laughs> they, but they maybe bring it. No, well, you stressed it a couple of times already in yeah. this podcast, but they probably bring you in to, uh, you know, discuss like technical things. So how, how do you do that? Is, is it clients like prospects that know you, they call you, or are you like very actively uh, going out there and, and, and doing lead generation and, and business development? No, honestly, we, we could do a lot more there. I think um, I'm, I'm also being honest here, um, which is also good in a sense because we, we, we've gotten where we are. Um, we're, we're 10 people now and it's, it's profitable so far. I mean, that's good, I think, even without, um, you know, lots of business development and, and, and all this uh, pipeline. But of course, that's where we need to go next, right? So yes, we have, we have a person that that does marketing and among many other things and so on. And, and then, but yeah, our sales pitches are probably too technical and, and it's honestly, it's, it's mostly clients. Um, it's hearsay, right? So, so they hear, okay, well, it's been successful at company X. I, I want to have this too. So I contact text shuttle. It's, it's not so much hmm. us going out there and, and doing this actively, um, which will probably need to change soon. Yeah. So what would help there is like getting some financing, maybe just to turbocharge this. Uh, like, have you ever considered taking on outside investment or what's your stance on there? Because like in this industry now, everybody and their mother is getting a series A, series B. It's crazy. Yeah, of course. And that's what I see when I when I read your, your newsletter or whatever. Right. So it's like, ah, oh, OK, company X acquired. Another. Yeah, OK. No, it's it's a possibility, certainly. Um, Again, we're surprised how well this has worked out um, in a sense. And to be honest, personally, at least, I'm actually quite happy about how this went down so far, because mm. I think if we had raised capital earlier, uh, we certainly would have grown faster. I think that, yeah, that's on, that's that would have been possible very well. But um, I don't think the product would have been better or would be better by now. I have my doubts, really, because we were able to like make decisions you know, based on, on, on actual needs, it doesn't have, it doesn't have to sound fancy or something. It was like, okay, there's an actual problem. We solve it. And then maybe we can, we can take a bit longer and, you know, implement it the way we think it's, it's good. And there has been a focus, um, for this reason, I think on how end users really use machine translation. So professional translators, again, um, it's not necessarily about, oh yeah, we have to tick, tick all of these boxes in an enterprise sales process, and then we need to get it into And then, well, the users that actually use it at the end of the day, that it's not necessarily useful to them. And, you know, I, I know this sounds all a bit um, idealistic and so on. And, and of, of course, this will also change to some extent and, and it will have to in the future. Um, but yeah, to come back to your question, Florian, I think, yeah, we are considering this. It's an option, um, not very actively. I also have to be honest there right now be because it still it still works and we can we can grow. Um, uh, yeah, but but I'm happy it didn't happen earlier. Good. And you said you're a team of ten people at the moment. Uh, what are those types of roles, and are you hiring for anything in particular right now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's mostly, it's mostly people with a technical background. So it's really, um, I mean, this is, this is one thing that we're very fortunate, of course, we, because we have close ties to, to academia, University of Zurich mainly, but not only, there's also ETH here in Zurich and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we have a good way to get hold of young talent, you know, to actually come into tech shuttle and, and then do awesome things, which is really great. Um, but, but yes, I, I'd say that basically seven out of these 10 people I was mentioning are, are people with a background in machine learning, um, or at least, um, well, informatics. Um, uh, but we are actually hiring for, well, we're hiring a backend engineer now. It's, that's a software development again, but we will be hiring, um, an account manager soon and also, um, other non-technical roles actually. So this is all on the horizon. Um, yeah, the next few weeks, you're probably going to see a few job ads. Should put them on your platform, right, Florian? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you a, yeah. a freebie, a freebie code <laughs> as, a, as a small thank you for the plot. Um, yeah, Very no, good. it's a good one. It, it works. Lockjobs.com, right? Just plug okay. it in. Um, <laughs> for the past few podcast episodes, I've been asking people about GPT-3 and you of all people should be mildly knowledgeable on that, I hope. What, what, what do you think is the big deal with GPT-3 and kind of these big multi-purpose language models in the context of a narrower use case like machine translation? 
or it, are you excited about this? Do you think it's an opportunity? Is it a, a threat? Like what's, what's going on with this? There's so many companies being built on, on, on this at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Language modeling, right? Obviously that's a part of machine translation. You, you ingest tons, but really tons of text. And then you model the language in that way and you can create new texts. And, and basically a machine translation is a, a machine translation system is a language model. It just has another, um, input source, basically the source text, right? So, but it, that, that just kind of changes the output in that direction. It, it also generates words at the end of the day. Um, so am I excited about GPT-3? Um, yes. And, and I'm mostly excited about, you know, the ability to actually get hold of so much language data and then actually train a model on to, uh, with this, all of this data in, you know, it's, it's also, it's, it's a lot of, lots of resources that are used there and so on. So this is the very interesting area, I think. Um, yeah, particular, I mean, used to machine translation, people have tried, um, right. Incorporating big language models into machine translation. Well, if you look at state of the art systems today, that's not necessarily a component. So I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. really sure, but this is where this is going. I'm not excited, you know, for, uh, as an MT researcher, particularly about GPT-3. Yes, I think it's very interesting, um, but not sure if it has a direct impact on machine translation uh, today, at least. But like writing something, like briefing the machine in one language and having an output in another language, would that be a feasible scenario? Because I mean, there's some of these companies like, uh, I don't call the name, but like other other side AI or copy, copy AI, like yeah. where, you, yeah, where you like brief the tool and then it's writing text for you. It's a bit of a niche question, but. I'm um, sure. Yeah. I, I think this, this will work. And I think, uh, Facebook has a model where this is it actually works very similar. It's just then it's, it's cross language. It's not, not monolingual. Um, yeah. In, I mean, you can even do it with GPT two or three. You can, you can, you can make a prompt and say, um, the man goes to the shop in French means Colin, and then it will complete the sentence in French. I mean, this already works with these models, right? So, uh, yeah. And so basically the concepts are very simple there. It's inherent learning of translation because translated sentences are, are out there on the internet. And if you use all of them to, to train a model, well, then the model can translate somehow. So, yeah. It's interesting. So when I, I think when I speak to the specialists like you, it's almost like you're trying to understand what is so exciting about this to the general public. Like you're like, well, yeah, I mean, it's obviously a continuation of everything that's happened, but it looks like they just threw gazillion, uh, you know, more data at it. But like, you're struggling to understand as far as like, I can judge this right now. You're struggling to understand like this excitement in, in kind of the tech, um, the tech publication with the tech blocks, everything. And like my excitement, because I don't understand the underlying, like, the, um, the trajectory of the technology up to where it is right now. I'm just seeing that all these people on Twitter are going crazy and posting these like, Hey, I just tested this tool and it's amazing. But from your side, it's like, it's just a steady continuation of things that have been done for the past 10, 15 years. Yeah. Because I mean, when we were studying computational linguistics, I don't know, machine learning for uh, natural language processing, essentially. I mean, we, we built systems like these 15, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it was just engram based, very few contexts. And then the sentences that would come out or were just, well, they were odd. Right. And of course, in that sense, it's, it's very interesting to see how, how fluent this suddenly is and how you can, you give it more context and it'll still actually mm. produce a meaningful con, con, um, continuation. Um, but, but yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. Sorry. Maybe that's why I'm not so super, super excited because I've seen text generation with a language model before. So it, the concept itself isn't really new. That doesn't mean it's not interesting for the industry. I mean, I, I do understand this, of course, if this gets fluent, if it's actually controllable. And I think there's the big problem because again, yes, you can get a continuation for your prompt. Um, but how can you then steer it to go into the right direction? I guess that's what these companies are now uh, trying to figure out. Um, th that's interesting. Yes, certainly interesting. And, and they are, they are certainly trying to figure out. I mean, again, I'm subscribing to one of them and I'm playing around and I'm like, it's kind of interesting, but not yet useful. Yeah, like yeah, I'm, write, I'm writing it, and I'm like, I read it, and it's like, well, I, it's interesting. I couldn't that, that's possibly what I mean. use it for anything. But yeah, it's, it's that's what I mean. It's, it's certainly exciting. Yeah. I also like playing around with these models, honestly, and and I have in the past. Um, but yeah, again, if if you wanna if you wanna you know create value with these systems, 
uh, mm. yeah, it's certainly feasible, but but let's see where it goes. Um, yeah. And what about the role of big tech in in all of this? And, and particularly, I think the the fact that you have Amazon, Google, Microsoft, I mean, becoming increasingly or offering increasing customization. They've got increasingly differentiated machine translation offerings as well. Um, I mean, is that a factor for you? How do you deal with with those kind of players? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even so sure. I mean, yes, there are offerings from these companies mm -hmm. and there have been. Um, you're now saying they're they're increasingly different. I'm I'm not even sure if I would agree there. Maybe we can discuss this a bit. You can you can give me some more context or your understanding. And and certainly, again, if we're talking professional translation, it doesn't seem to me that these companies are interested in solving you know problems that professional translators have. I mean, this is primarily geared to end users who use raw machine translation. That that's my understanding, yeah. right? And I guess there's more value there. Um, uh, yeah. So in that sense, customization, not so sure if, if that, if that's really a priority for them, of course, you can now use, you can lexicalize your machine translations with Amazon, give it a glossary and then do things. Yes. Mm. Is this increasing customization again, this was possible in 2012. I don't know. Um, you have to tell me, maybe you see it more from, from an end user's uh, perspective or, or like if you, if you do some industry research there. Yeah. I mean, I think it's more to understand if you're likely, for example, to bump up against them, if you're ever talking to customers or, oh, and I, yeah, I but I do, I do think you're right that yes, it's, they're not targeting specifically the professional translator, but we do see announcements coming out from them. I think Microsoft was the latest one we discussed earlier about, um, full document translation so it is the yeah. end user yeah 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 i see I, I see no um that that's not typically a problem i mean yes maybe deep l as a competitor we see that yes but that's mostly because for for many people in the german speaking market at least deep l is good machine translation these days mm. right so okay um yeah but but again i think wasn't it Slater that once described Text Shuttle as as a, a boutique player or something? And and I think that's true, right? So if if you if you want a machine translation system for your team of professionals, it's gonna make them faster, and you you can you know can monetize it. You can you can make a business case. I mean that's not the same as just just going and seeing like you know yeah I I just connect some system and then see what comes out. So I, basically this is a different setup. And and honestly, mm. I think many people would also struggle to actually integrate these services meaningfully into, into their processes. And of course, Tech Shuttle doesn't only produce machine translation systems. We also consult people. We tell them, well, how can you configure this? How can you configure your workflows? How can you train your translators yeah. and so on? And I think that's, that's also a differentiator there. Um, yeah, you could pro yeah. potentially, yeah. Even, even if that, if, I mean, our observation was just that Amazon, Google, and Microsoft in particular are just adding almost on a weekly basis now, especially Microsoft and Amazon. They're publishing blog posts almost on a weekly basis about new features, new customization options. Hey, upload your glossary here. Here's a uh, uh, a batch translation function mm -hmm. so you can upload like a series of like different file formats and, and it basically comes back. You know, and, and like even if you have mixed uh, source languages, etc. So they're, they're, they're like bit by bit adding these like customization options to their, you know, obviously raw MT output. But I hear you what you're saying. Like even if you're like if you're a a language manager at a mid-sized insurance company or even a large insurance company, are you going to be able to really like? even do that particular setup, even you yeah. probably would struggle with that. And that's where you guys could come in managed as kind of the M managed MT uh, provider, right? Exactly. Yeah. Because I think that's not interesting to these companies. If it were, it would be easily integratable or you could connect it out of the box to the, the tooling you have typically in these scenarios, right? And, and then vice versa. So yeah, I, I think that's a good summary, Florian. Yeah. Got it. Um, MT Outlook next, I don't know, two, three, four, five years. <laughs> Most exciting areas. What are you guys working on? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, 
again, predictions are always wrong in this field. I, I stand by it. Uh, let's see. <laughs> no, but I think on, on the on the immediate uh, horizon, if you yeah. will, um, I mentioned uh, controllability before. I mean, well, one thing this whole you know, focus on sentences and context, getting larger and larger document level translation. This is clearly coming. It, it, you could, you could argue it's solved in research. It's, it's a matter of how much money people want to invest to, to run it now. This is an exaggeration, but, but I think this is one change you'll see. Like mistranslated pronouns in, in sentences. Well, this will not go away, but it will be better, I guess. Um, what are we working on? Uh, we're also working on, um, controllability in the sense, um, of, uh, well, again, I said it before, using resources that have been created. Um, it's, you know, it's funny. People were so excited for a long time and still, I think, about this adaptive machine translation paradigm, right? So the idea where, oh, you, 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 I don't know, you, you edit the translation and then it does, it does it the same way in future projects or even in the same document. Um, but well, at TechShot, we find this a bit weird in the sense that if you have your resources available, if at a certain company you have your glossary and you know, I want to translate X as Y, why do you, why does the machine translation system have to make a mistake and you have to correct it and maybe correct it again for the system to eventually learn what's already known up front, right? So mm -hmm. I think there again, domain adaptation where you don't necessarily need to fine tune your systems and do long trainings, but if you activate this translation memory, Oh, okay. The empty output is going to look like that. If you connect this glossary, the empty output is going to look like that. Um, th that's what we're working on, for example. And I think others will be too. And, and yeah, I guess that's, that's going to be interesting for people who use machine translation in, in professional contexts in particular. Cool. Well, thanks so much for taking the time today. That was, uh, that was super interesting. We could go on for, uh, for a lot longer, but, uh, uh, you know, let's, uh, Let's put the, the pause button here and, uh, and get you back on the pod at some time in the future, maybe in the next three to five years. <laughs> Check and we'll in. See we'll replay. Decided. Yeah, we'll replay your comments and see how that goes. <laughs> but the five year thing is actually correct. Cause I mean, now I've been doing this with Slater for six years and I mean, you know, it's five years on now and it's not like it's solved and the industry continues to grow and the customization continues to happen. So, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see if the artificial general intelligence is going to emerge anytime soon. <laughs> Let's see. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Samuel. Thanks Thank uh, you. for this. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me. See you.